Abraham Lincoln, who was the President of the United States from 1861 to 1865, no doubt has his name in the history books for his crucial role in ending slavery in the country. The story goes that Lincoln stepped into the presidency at a time when the storm clouds of conflict were gathering. The United States was torn between North and South, with the deep chasm of slavery at its core. The Southern states clung to the institution of slavery, upon which their economies and ways of life were built. The North, however, increasingly saw slavery as a moral wrong that needed to be abolished. This fundamental disagreement sparked the flames of the Civil War. In the midst of this tumultuous period, Lincoln, with his tall, lanky frame and a face marked by the burdens of leadership, saw an opportunity to change the course of history. On the first day of January 1863, in the war's grim shadow, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. This historic document didn't immediately free all slaves, but declared that slaves in the Confederate States were to be set free. It was a beacon of hope, a promise of a better future, but its light could only reach so far. The proclamation applied only to territories still in rebellion, places beyond Lincoln's immediate control. Yet, this act was a masterstroke. It transformed the Civil War from a battle over Union to a profound struggle for freedom. Black men, once bound by chains, now took up arms to fight for the Union, their freedom, and the freedom of their brethren still in bondage. They fought bravely, believing in the cause and in the promise of a nation where all men could truly be free. The war raged on, and with each Union victory, the Emancipation Proclamation freed more slaves. The march towards freedom was slow and fraught with hardship, but it was unrelenting. Then, in the twilight of the war and Lincoln's own life, a new dawn broke. The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution was passed, abolishing slavery forever. Today, Abraham Lincoln is remembered as the president who took bold steps to end slavery and ensure freedom for all slaves in America. While the act was right by all means, the truth behind it is shocking. Lincoln didn't free black slaves because he believed they deserved to be free or because he believed they were equal to whites. In fact, Lincoln didn't free black slaves because he believed in black freedom. The shocking revelations in this video go to prove that history can sometimes not reveal the whole truth. Did Abraham Lincoln truly care about black people, or did he see them as a means to an end? Were they just pawns in his war to keep the United States from falling apart? Welcome to Black Journals, where you can discover true black history and black narratives. Also, as a way of supporting the channel, hit the like button of the video, share, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Your support means a lot to us. Number 1. Lincoln wasn't an abolitionist. Abraham Lincoln, while often celebrated as the great emancipator, did not initially align himself with the radical stance of abolitionists during his time. He never believed that abolishing slavery was the right thing to do until the Civil War. Despite his personal belief that slavery was inherently wrong, Lincoln navigated the treacherous waters of a nation deeply divided by the issue with caution and, some might argue, a frustrating lack of urgency. This careful approach was largely because the very foundation of the United States, the Constitution, protected the institution of slavery through several clauses, despite not naming it directly. These included the Fugitive Slave Clause and the Three-Fifths Clause, both of which served to entrench the practice of slavery in the political and economic fabric of the country. In an era where abolitionists, led by figures like William Lloyd Garrison, were calling for immediate emancipation and equal rights for freed slaves, Lincoln's reluctance to outright challenge the Constitution's concessions to slavery placed him in a morally ambiguous position. Garrison's dramatic condemnation of the Constitution as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell, highlighted by his act of burning the document, starkly contrasted with Lincoln's more measured legalistic opposition to slavery. 
Lincoln's famous speech in Peoria, Illinois, in 1854, did articulate his opposition to slavery on moral, legal, and economic grounds. Yet, his admission of uncertainty about how to address the issue within the existing political framework underscored a perceived lack of resolve. This cautious approach frustrated many abolitionists who saw any compromise on the issue of slavery as complicity in a deeply immoral system. It wasn't until the Civil War, with the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation and his support for the 13th Amendment, that Lincoln took decisive steps to end slavery. However, this shift was as much a strategic war measure as it was a moral stance aimed at weakening the Confederacy and preserving the Union. Number two, Lincoln didn't believe black people should have the same rights as white people. This might sound strange since the same man gave freedom to black people making them just as equal as whites. However, there are many aspects to freedom. While someone might no longer be a slave, they could be excluded from equal social and political rights hindering their chances at a good life. Initially, Lincoln's perspectives on racial equality were far from progressive, especially by today's standards. His views became clear during an 1858 series of debates with his opponent in the Illinois race for U.S. Senate, Stephen Douglas, who had accused him of supporting Negro equality. In their fourth debate at Charleston, Illinois, on September 18, 1858, Lincoln made his position clear. I will say then that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, he began, going on to say that he opposed black people having the right to vote, to serve on juries, to hold office, and to intermarry with whites. What he did believe was that, like all men, Black men had the right to improve their condition in society and to enjoy the fruits of their labor. In this way, they were equal to white men, and for this reason, slavery was inherently unjust. Lincoln's position was a reflection of the times, deeply influenced by the prevalent societal norms and attitudes toward race. His primary objective was to preserve the Union, and his views on slavery and racial equality were secondary often adapted to suit this goal. In the mid-19th century, America was a deeply divided nation, not just geographically between North and South, but morally and ideologically when it came to the issue of slavery and the status of Black Americans, both free and enslaved. Lincoln's cautious approach to emancipation and racial equality was, in part, a strategic attempt to maintain support from a broad coalition of Northerners, including those who were not in favor of abolition or equal rights for African Americans. This political balancing act required him to navigate a delicate line, advocating for the end of slavery while not endorsing full equality for African Americans. However, it's crucial to note that Lincoln's views were not static and showed signs of evolution over time particularly during his presidency. The Civil War, fundamentally a conflict over the fate of slavery in America, forced Lincoln to confront the moral and ethical dimensions of slavery directly. By the end of his life, in the shadow of a war that had transformed the nation, Lincoln began to advocate for limited suffrage for black men, particularly for those who had served in the Union Army. This was a significant departure from his earlier stance and indicated a shift toward recognizing the rights and contributions of African Americans. Number three, emancipation was a military policy. The Civil War, at its core, was indeed a battle over the future of slavery in the United States, a moral and ethical quagmire that tore at the fabric of the nation. President Abraham Lincoln, a figure often enshrined in the glow of emancipation and the abolition of slavery, navigated these turbulent waters with a pragmatism that, while strategically sound, casts a long shadow over the legacy of his administration. The path to emancipation was neither straightforward 
nor imbued with the purity of intent that popular history often ascribes to it. As the war progressed into its second grueling year in 1862, the issue of slavery became impossible to ignore, not just as a moral failing of a nation, but as a tactical element within the larger strategy of war. Thousands of enslaved people, seizing upon the chaos of conflict, fled their captors' plantations, seeking refuge with Union forces. Their flight laid bare the strategic folly of the Union's lack of policy regarding these escapees. They were, after all, assets to the Confederacy, both economically and logistically. Lincoln's realization that emancipation could serve as a weapon against the Confederacy reveals a stark truth. The liberation of enslaved people was considered within the context of military advantage rather than purely on the basis of human rights and dignity. When Lincoln presented his preliminary draft of the Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet in July 1862, it was not met with unanimous enthusiasm. Secretary of State William Seward's caution to wait for a Union victory before announcing the proclamation underscores a cynical manipulation of timing, suggesting that the moral imperative of emancipation was secondary to its perceived impact on public relations and international perception. The implication is clear. Emancipation was a card to be played at the most opportune moment, not a principle to be upheld irrespective of political and military calculations. The Battle of Antietam, a bloody and brutal engagement, provided the veneer of victory Lincoln needed to proceed. The issuance of the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation following this battle was a calculated move, leveraging the slight shift in momentum to frame the proclamation as a position of strength rather than desperation. Yet, the reality remains that this strategic decision was made against the backdrop of immense suffering, both on the battlefield and within the plantation system that the war sought to preserve or dismantle. Lincoln's address to the crowd from the White House balcony, placing his trust in God and the judgment of the country and the world, paints the picture of a leader burdened with an immense decision. However, this solemn moment also serves to obscure the underlying calculations and compromises that marked the road to emancipation. It was a decision shaped by military necessity political pragmatism, and the desire to maintain the Union at all costs, even if it meant delaying justice for the enslaved until it was deemed strategically advantageous. The path to emancipation, then, is marred by the harsh realities of war and the complexities of political leadership in a divided nation. While the Emancipation Proclamation stands as a landmark achievement in the fight against slavery, the journey to that point reveals a web of motives, calculations, and concessions that challenge the narrative of a purely noble quest for freedom. In this light, the proclamation is a document born out of war's exigencies, a tool wielded in the service of union and victory as much as, if not more than, in the service of liberty and justice. Number 4. The Emancipation Proclamation didn't actually free all enslaved people. The Emancipation Proclamation, a significant document in American history, is often celebrated for freeing the slaves. However, the truth is not as straightforward or as noble as many believe. President Abraham Lincoln, often hailed as the Great Emancipator, issued this proclamation during the Civil War, not out of a pure moral conviction to end slavery, but as a strategic move in a desperate time. First and foremost, the Emancipation Proclamation did not, in fact, free all enslaved people. Its reach was limited and calculated. Lincoln used it as a military strategy, aiming to weaken the Confederate states by targeting their economy, which heavily relied on slave labor. However, the proclamation conveniently excluded the border states of Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. These states, though slaveholding, remained loyal to the Union, and Lincoln feared pushing them into the arms of the Confederacy. Missouri presented a unique case with dual governments, 
one Unionist and one Confederate. But even here, the proclamation's reach was nullified by exemptions. Furthermore, the proclamation exempted certain areas of the Confederacy that had already fallen under Union control. This exemption was a calculated move by Lincoln to win over the loyalty of white people in these areas, effectively placing military and political strategy over the moral imperative of ending slavery. Thus, in the places where the proclamation could have made a real impact, it was rendered impotent by these exemptions. The irony is palpable. The document heralded as a beacon of freedom had no immediate effect on the lives of the very people it purported to liberate. The bitter truth is that the Emancipation Proclamation, in its immediate aftermath, did not free a single enslaved person. Its authority extended only to the Confederate states actively fighting against the Union, territories where the U.S. government had no control at the time. This fact lays bare the hypocrisy of the proclamation, showcasing it as a gesture that was more symbolic than substantive, a tool of war rather than a genuine effort to eradicate the abomination of slavery. Despite its glaring limitations and the strategic motivations behind its issuance, the Emancipation Proclamation is often credited with marking a turning point in the Civil War and in Lincoln's own views on slavery. Indeed, it paved the way for the enlistment of approximately 200,000 black men in the Union Army and Navy, contributing significantly to the Union's victory and the eventual abolition of slavery with the 13th Amendment. However, this outcome does not erase the proclamation's initial inadequacies and the calculated political maneuvering that characterized its inception. The proclamation's legacy is a complex one, embodying both a step toward freedom and a testament to the compromises and contradictions of wartime leadership. It reminds us that the path to justice and equality is often fraught with hypocrisy and half-measures, highlighting the importance of scrutinizing the motives behind even the most celebrated acts of liberation. In essence, the Emancipation Proclamation serves as a stark reminder that in the pursuit of freedom and justice, intentions matter just as much as actions, and that true liberation cannot be achieved through strategic exemptions and political calculus. Number five, Lincoln thought colonization could resolve the issue of slavery. The idea that Abraham Lincoln one of the most celebrated figures in American history, once seriously considered colonization as a solution to the problem of slavery, is a stark reminder of the complexities and contradictions that define human beings, especially those in positions of power. Lincoln, often idolized for his role in emancipating slaves, harbored views that, when examined closely, reveal a disturbing willingness to entertain solutions that would today be considered egregiously unjust and racist. Colonization, the concept of relocating African Americans to places like Africa or Central America, was not unique to Lincoln. It was a widely discussed idea among many who, while uncomfortable with the institution of slavery, could not envision a society where black and white people coexisted as equals. This perspective was deeply flawed and reflected the pervasive racism of the time. It is unsettling to think that leaders like Lincoln, who are often portrayed as forward-thinking and morally upright, could hold such views. Lincoln's advocacy for colonization, starting in the early 1850s, underscores a harsh truth. His opposition to slavery was not necessarily rooted in a belief in racial equality. By suggesting that freed slaves be sent to Liberia, Lincoln was essentially arguing for a solution that would remove African Americans from the United States rather than integrating them into society as equals. This stance is contradictory to the principles of equality and justice and reflects a profound failure to recognize African Americans as rightful citizens of their own country. On the night of December 31, 1862, a day before he issued the final Emancipation Proclamation to effectively end slavery in America, President Abraham Lincoln signed a contract with Bernard Koch, an entrepreneur and Florida cotton planter. 
their agreement to use federal funds to relocate 5,000 formerly enslaved people from the United States to Ilavash, Cow Island, a small 20-square-mile island off the southwestern coast of Haiti. Since the early 1850s, Lincoln had been advancing colonization as a remedy for the gradual emancipation of the nation's enslaved. While he strongly opposed the institution of slavery, he didn't believe in racial equality or that people of different races could successfully integrate. And unleashing nearly four million black people into white American society, North or South, was a political non-starter. So despite the fact that most black Americans in the 1850s had been born on U.S. soil, Lincoln advocated shipping them to Central America, the Caribbean, or back to Africa. If, as the friends of colonization hope, we succeed in freeing our land from the dangerous presence of slavery, and at the same time, in restoring a captive people to their long lost fatherland, Lincoln said during his eulogy for statesman Henry Clay in 1852, it will indeed be a glorious consummation. Nearly a month before he signed the contract with Koch, during his second annual message to Congress, Lincoln had proposed a constitutional amendment to colonize African Americans outside the United States. The amendment included federal compensation for slave owners who lost their human property due to emancipation. Looking for proof of concept, Lincoln settled on Cox Il Avash proposal after serious consideration of another colonization plan that would have sent freed black Americans to the Chiriqui province of Panama. In Cox's plan, the former slaves would work on a cotton plantation. Each family would receive homes and access to hospitals and schools. And after the end of their four-year work contracts, they would be given 16 acres of land and the wages they had earned over that period. Colonization was voluntary for former slaves, but deeply encouraged by Lincoln, Cox, and its many other proponents. The colonization movement was never popular with most African Americans and abolitionists. Shame upon the guilty wretches that dare propose and all that countenance such a proposition, wrote Frederick Douglass, the famed abolitionist orator and publisher in his newspaper, The North Star in 1849. We live here, have lived here, have a right to live here and mean to live here. On August 14, 1862, Lincoln met at the White House delegation of black leaders to make his case for the voluntary emigration of African Americans to countries outside the U.S. Your race suffer from living among us, while ours suffer from your presence. It is better for us both, therefore, to be separated, Lincoln told the delegation. Douglas, who wasn't invited, and who read about the meeting in a newspaper, wrote in his Douglas Monthly that the proposal reminds one of the politeness with which a man might try to bow out of his house some troublesome creditor or the witness of some old guilt. Lincoln was undeterred by these complaints from Douglas and other African-American leaders. On April 14, 1863, the vessel Ocean Ranger departed from Fortress Monroe, Virginia, with 453 hopeful African-American emigrants aboard, headed to Il Avash. The mission proved an unmitigated failure from the start, according to Graham Welch, an historian and attorney. By the time the Ocean Ranger reached Il Avash in early May, at least 30 of its black passengers had died from smallpox. A second ship, which was supposed to follow the Ocean Ranger with building and living supplies, never set sail. Cock, the self-appointed superintendent of the island, had misled the government and the black settlers about the living conditions. On a visit to the island, a government official found the African-American settlers with tears, misery, and sorrow pictured in every countenance. Instead of the homes they were promised, the families slept on the ground in small huts made of palmetto and brush. Cock offered wages in a self-printed currency which workers were obliged to spend on exorbitantly priced food and goods in a kind of company shop. There was also a no work, no rations policy. 
When the emigrant workers threatened revolt, Koch fled. By the summer of 1863, news of the inhumane conditions in Ila Vash reached Lincoln, who confided in Union Army Chaplain John Eaton that the Negroes in the Cow Island settlement on the coast of Haiti were suffering intensely from a pest of jiggers from which there seemed to be no escape or protection. On February 1, 1864, the President ordered his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, to commission a naval vessel to rescue the Ila Vash group. A month later, the Navy's Marcia C. Day carried the 350 surviving emigrants back to America, arriving in Alexandria, Virginia on March 20. Also in March, Lincoln signed a bill withdrawing the $600,000 appropriated for colonization, of which the administration had spent only about $38,000. According to Welch, Lincoln's signing of the bill signaled that he was finally abandoning colonization as a viable option for those freed from slavery. Following his reversal of the Il Avash venture, Lincoln not only remained silent on the failed Haitian colony, but also never issued another public statement concerning colonization, Welch wrote. Instead, Lincoln began exploring ways to integrate those he had freed into a post-emancipation society. While Ila Vash was a disastrous failure that led to the deaths of many African Americans, the end of colonization as government policy, with the affair heart and many African Americans who had opposed emigrating to another country. The backlash from black leaders and abolitionists against Lincoln's colonization plans was justified and necessary. Their anger and opposition highlighted the hypocrisy of a nation that claimed to value freedom and equality while simultaneously contemplating the mass expulsion of its black population. The fact that Lincoln eventually dropped public mention of colonization after the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation does not erase the discomforting reality that such ideas were considered at all. It raises questions about the nature of Lincoln's legacy and the true motivations behind his policies. In wrapping up our examination of Abraham Lincoln's perspectives on race and his support for the colonization of African Americans, it's crucial to confront the uncomfortable nuances of his legacy. While Lincoln is lauded for issuing the Emancipation Proclamation and thereby playing a pivotal role in the abolition of slavery, the motivations behind his actions and his beliefs about racial equality reveal a more complex and less flattering image. Our exploration has uncovered that Lincoln harbored racist ideas, believing African Americans were inferior to whites and entertaining the notion that they should be colonized outside the United States. As we reflect on Lincoln's place in history, it's essential to acknowledge these uncomfortable truths. While he remains a pivotal figure in the American narrative for his role in ending slavery, we must also recognize the limitations of his views on race and equality. The journey towards racial justice is fraught with contradictions, and Lincoln's story is no exception. He was a man of his time, shaped by the prevailing attitudes and beliefs of his era, which included deeply ingrained racism. This brings us to the end of this video. Tell us what you think in the comments section, as we are always interested in your thoughts. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.